Greetings, I'm Squared, and here, and we are going to review for our topic one test. So, I'm just going to go through the questions, and I'll pause so that you can answer it, or you can pause your little video yourself. So, the first learning target that we had was um, to identifying the different types of numbers. So, we have eight different options here. We're going to tell which kind of numbers there are. So remember when we start with this, this list isn't, isn't in order. Numbers are either rational or irrational. It can't be both. Remember, IR means not. So if it's rational, it can't be not rational. So rational is all a set all by itself. So the first ones we start with are natural. That's just the positive whole numbers. Then we have whole numbers add zero, integers adds negatives, rational add fractions. So those are all in one group called rational numbers. And then irrational numbers are the other set. And together, the rational and irrational make up real numbers. Since they're all real numbers, I don't make you write the real numbers. So we're just going to go through this. Number one, square root of seven. Um, anytime you see a square root, your little antenna needs to go up and say it's probably irrational, but I need to check if there's actually a perfect square. You can check that in your calculator, or maybe you've memorized the first few. Hopefully you have. So the square root of 7, there's no integer or decimal that when you multiply by itself equals 7. So number 1 is an irrational number. 13. 13 doesn't have any parts to it, um, like a half or a third or a decimal. It doesn't have a negative. So that is a natural number. But because it's a natural number, it's also a whole number, an integer, and a rational number. So um, it's important to know it's all four of them, because on the test you have to say all that it is. Since this is a fraction part, it automatically tells me, hey, that's rational. So that one's rational. Negative and positives, doesn't matter. Fraction tells me it's rational. Zero is a whole number, so it's also an integer and a rational number. Pi is the most popular irrational number, in my opinion. And so it doesn't have a square root, but it does go on forever and never repeat. 11 sevenths, that's a fraction. So if it can be written as a fraction, that's a rational number because this that's what that starts with the ratio. It means it can be written as a ratio of two integers. 11 and 7 are integers. So that is a rational number. Negative 6 is an integer and a rational number. And the square root of 25, although it has a square root, we can take the square root of 25, it's 5, because 5 times 5 is 25. So we know that that's a natural number, a whole number, an integer, and a rational number. All right. On to learning target two. Learning target two is about the sums and products of rational or irrational, if the sums and products are rational or irrational. So um, I don't know if you remember the rule, but if you have a rational number plus or minus a rational or times a rational, it always gets you a rational number. So if they're both rational, you're going to get a rational. If you have one of each, it's always going to be irrational when you're doing sums and products. So rational, irrational, that means the product, I mean the sum, that's a plus sign, the sum is irrational because I had one of each. Number two, those are both rational. So when I subtract them, I'm still going to get a rational number. 15 minus 12 is 3. That's rational. Um, I don't really have to find the sum or product. I just have to tell if it's rational or irrational. That's this goal. Rational times rational is always rational. Rational times irrational is always irrational. Now, these look like square roots, but when you look at it, the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 100 is 10, so they simplify to rational numbers. So when I add two rational numbers, I get a rational number. And again, one of each, irrational, rational, I get irrational. So that's the big idea there. Both rational, it's rational. One of each, it is not rational, so it's irrational. Right. Now, on to learning target three, where we were solving equations where x was only on one side of the variable. So I'm going to go ahead and solve that for you. The first thing we remember we do is we're going to get rid of those parentheses. Now, the big thing you've got to watch for, you probably want to pause it, do it on your own, and then come back and see if you're right. But the big thing you want to watch for where most people are making the mistakes is a negative 4 times a negative 2. That's a positive 8x. So we want to be careful that we watch their, that sign there. So the first step on this one, because we didn't have any fractions, was to get rid of parentheses, which we did. The next step was to combine like terms on each side. Well, there's only one number over there, so nothing to do over there. But on this side, we can combine these. It's kind of like switching the order using our commutative, or I mean our associative property. So 3x plus 8x is 11x. 
So now I have 11x minus 20. Then when I add 20 to both sides, I get 11x equals 33. I divide both sides by 11, and I get x equals 3. Now, if you're on a test, it's really good to plug it back in and see if it works. So 3x times 3, I mean 3 times 3 is 9. This is my check. Here, I'll switch colors so you can see my check. This is 9 minus 4 times 5. 3 times 2 is 6 minus 6. So 5 minus 6 is negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 4 is 4, plus 9 is indeed 13. So I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm correct because I checked it. I took the time to check it. Okay, still in learning target 3 where I have a variable on one side. So now I have fractions. So we always said that the first step we're going to take to get rid of is to get rid of the fractions. So to get rid of the fractions, you have to find the common denominator and multiply everything by the common denominator. So I always look at the biggest number first in the denominator, and I ask myself if everything else goes into that. And yes, six, three goes into six. So I know the six, <coughs> excuse me, is my common denominator. So I'm going to multiply everything by six. Now here you have an option. You can say six x divided by six, or you can say six divided by six times x. I prefer the latter. I like to cancel. That's a one, so I just get an x. 3 goes into 6 2 times, so now I have 2 times 2, which is 4. 3 goes into 6 2 times, so now I have 11 times 2, which is 22. And if I subtract 4 from both sides, I get 18. So that answer is 18. Now, I can check that, right? I can put 18 back up there. So I can say 18 over 6 does it equal, I'm sorry, plus 2 thirds. Does that equal 11 thirds? So this is 3, because 18 divided by 6 is 3. If I subtract 2 thirds from both sides, I get 9 thirds. And guess what 9 thirds is? 3. So I just checked 3 equals 3. Woohoo! We're right. OK, I'm not going to check anymore, but I wanted to make sure you understood how to check. All right, here we go. So we've got fractions again. So sometimes I look at it to see if I can not multiply everything, but in this case I'm going to because that 7 doesn't go. If I was to distribute the 4, it would give me another fraction. So I might as well get rid of the fractions. Now here's another tricky part. When we multiply everything by 4, this is considered one thing because it's a product. So I have to multiply that whole thing by 4. Then I multiply this by 4, this by 4 and this by 4. So it's a little bit tricky because sometimes people want to multiply outside and inside. That would be multiplying by 16. You do not want to do that when you're multiplying everything by 4. So cancels. That's why I did it. I get 12x minus 7. Don't even need to distribute because that's a 1 now. 4 times x equals 1 plus 8x when I multiply everything by 4. So next step, combine like terms on one side. So I have a 12x and a 4x, which gets me a 16x. And when I subtract 8x from both sides, I get 8x. When I add 7 to both sides, I get 8. So if I divide both sides by 8, I get x equals 1. So the answer to that one is x equals 1. OK, next one. Now we're on to learning target. Oh, we, that, that one was learning target 4, too, because so, it had x on both sides. This one also has x on both sides, so we're going to do learning target 4. Solve this equation. So no fractions to speak of. So we get to just distribute. You know, I'm going to distribute right now. So 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8x. 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times negative x is negative 3x. And the parentheses stopped, so I just have a plus 12. So I'm going to simplify by combining like terms on each side. 5x minus 3x is negative 3x plus 6. 12 plus 12 is 24, minus 3x. Now, what I notice, and it's good to notice things when you're doing math, is that I have a negative 3x on both sides. That means they're going to cancel out. Watch, when I add 3x to both sides, I'm going to get 6 equals 24. When all the x's go bye-bye, remember we have one of two things. We either have an infinite number of solutions or we have a no solution, and it depends on whether this is true or false. So you have to ask yourself, is 6 equal to 24? Answer, no. 
That means that this isn't the answer. Make sure you know that you have to put no solution as your answer because this is the answer. There's no x value that would make that true. It's just not possible. So that's a no solution. All righty. Learning target four. Write an equation that has an infinite number of solutions. Well, we just kind of had one. But base, well, we had a no solution, sorry. So basically, it doesn't matter. Um, both sides just have to be the same. So I could be really simple and say 5x equals 5x. I could say 5x plus 2 equals 5x plus 2. Anything like that. I can be fancy and use parentheses and fractions, but why? Everything on one side has to be exactly the same as the other side, so just keep that in mind. Now, if I was going to write an equation that had no solutions, then I would have to change a constant on one side, not the x's. The x's have to be the same. So that means I could just add 5 here. Because then when the 5x's cancel out, I get 2 plus 5. So with a no solution, you just have to make sure that the x's are exactly the same on both sides, but the numbers are not. Now on to learning target 6, where we were solving equations that had, uh, they're called literal equations, or formulas. And we have to get a variable alone, and we have a lot of other variables. So I always have to ask myself what's happening to the x, but I want to keep in mind that I, if I need to get rid of fractions first, that's what I should do. So if you were um, trying to get rid of the fractions, you would multiply by the common denominator, which in this case is y. That was not a pretty y. <laughs> so I'm going to multiply both sides by y. That cancels. That's why I do it. So I get r squared y equals 3x, 3kx. And then I ask myself, OK, I'm trying to get x alone. How do I get rid of this? Well, what is it doing to the x? Both of these are being multiplied by x. To get rid of multiplication, I always divide. So that goes away, and I get x equals r squared y over 3k. Make sure you pay attention to the capital and lowercase letters. Um, capital letters keep capital. Lowercase keep lowercase. It's, important, uh, it's an important concept to get, especially when you go into geometry next year. Right, again, learning target 6, P equals Z plus XY. We're trying to get Y alone. So the first thing I have to do is get rid of this Z because I want to save the multiplication division thing till later. So I always want to get rid of what's added or subtracted. Now, some people forget that there's a plus sign in front of that. So if this had been minus, they would think that they have to add it. So just make sure that your Z minus Z, make sure it cancels out. Don't look at the sign in front of something else. Look at the, always look at the, front of the, the sign in front of the variable you're working with. Again, P minus Z is P minus Z because they're not like terms. Now be careful with that. And then to get Y alone, these are being multiplied. So I do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. And this is my answer. P minus Z over X. All righty. Write an equation that could be used to solve the sum of three consecutive even integers is 63. Well, my first integer I would call x. My second integer, since it's going to be even, is two more than that. So the way I do that is x plus two. And the next integer is even, so I add two more to what I just did, so that's x plus four. And together, they're sum, that's why I added is equal to 63. So remember, in this learning target, you don't actually have to solve it. You just have to write an equation that you could use to solve it. So that is that one. Remember, even numbers are two apart, and odd numbers are also two apart. If I had said odd, that would be the exact same equation. However, if I said integers, consecutive integers, then I would be plus 1 and plus 2, because consecutive integers are only one apart. OK, so here we go, the sum of three consecutive integers. So the first one would be x. The next one would be one more than that, because like 2, 3, 4, 3 is one more than 2, so that's x plus 1. And then it would be x plus 2. So those are my three integers, and they say the sum is 153. So then I would say equals 153. OK, again, we're not solving it. We're just writing the equation. OK. Here is another word problem you have to write an equation for. So Mrs. Carter needs to plant 50 trees. She has 11 trees. Okay, so we know our total has to be 50. We know I already have 11. 
Okay, so I need to plant 11, I need to plant, plant how many trees? Well, that doesn't matter, because remember, we're just writing the equation. You could subtract, right? You get 39, but we don't need to know that right now. We're writing an equation. The focus is, the goal is, write the equation. If she plants six trees each week, remember that each week thing? Each week is like your per whatever. So it says down here, W is going to be our each week, I mean our, our week. And it says how many each week? Um, what does it say? Oh, each tree costs $14. Okay, I don't know if I need that yet. I'm going to put that over here because there was nothing about money in here. So I'm just going to write that down. If she plants six trees each week, how many weeks will it be? Will it take her to have a total of 50 plants? Okay, so I'm going to get six a week. I'm going to add that to my 11, and I'm going to figure out how long it takes me to get 50. Notice there was no price involved. Didn't say anything about money except that little sentence. So that's kind of something that I don't need to worry about because the, it's not asking me the total money. It's asking me just for how many weeks. So be careful with tricky things like that because sometimes there's extra information that you don't really need. But that is my equation. Alrighty. Remember, I don't know if, I don't care if you solve it. I just want you to be able to write an equation. Now we're on to learning target seven, solving inequalities. So these are just regular inequalities and learning target eight, which is our last one, is compound inequalities. So it's kind of like um, solving an equation. The two differences are if I divide or multiply by a negative, I have to switch the inequality sign because it switches which side is less than or greater than. And the second one is I don't just get one answer. I get an in infinite number of answers, but they can be graphed on a number line. So distribute 24 minus 6x is greater than or equal to 36. If I subtract 24 from both sides, I get negative 6x is greater than or equal to 12. If I divide both sides by a negative, remember, negative, then I'm going to af absolutely have to switch that. So I'm going to get x, and then instead of greater than or equal to, I'm going to get less than or equal to negative 2. To graph that, I need to know if it's an open or closed circle. So I've got 0, 1, 2, 3. Whoops, that's a negative 2. Let me go this way a little bit. Negative 1, negative 2. So I've got a closed circle because that line under that means it can be less than, which is all the things over here, or it can be equal to. That's why I put the dot solid because that means it's equal to that number. So x is less than or equal to negative 2. That is my graph. Remember, the other way to do it would be like that. And this is my solution. You need both. Both are super, super important. So at the end of your inequality things, it would be great if you just look back on the test and say, did I ever divide by a negative? Because if I did, i got to make sure I switch that sign. It's just something to think about when you're all done. OK, this one. Distribute 2x minus 6 is less than 15 minus 10x. So that's me distributing on both sides. Now. I need to move all the x's to one side and all the numbers constants to the other side. So I'm going to add 6 to both sides, which cancels that, and I'm going to add 10x to both sides. Notice I got the x's on one side and the numbers on the other side. You don't want all of them on one side. So 15 plus 6 is 21, and that's 12x. So if I divide by 12, yes, I know it's not an integer. But 3 goes into there 7 times, 3 goes into there 4 times, so that is 7 fourths. That's an acceptable answer. You can also say x is less than 1.75. That's also fine if you like the decimal. Um, this one doesn't say to graph it. I will real quick, just so you know. Um, if you have a 0, a 1, a 2, 1.75 is going to be like right here. It's an open circle. And it says less than, so it would be going to the left. If x is on the left, you follow the arrow. Because x is less than 1.75, that means all of the x is to the left of it. All righty. Next. Really, it's here somewhere. Write this inequality. OK, now we just have a graph, and we have to write the inequality. Well, it's an open circle, and it's going to the right. So x, we want our arrow to go to the right. So x is greater than negative 3. No equal sign because that circle is open. So that is the inequality. This is learning target 8 where you have a compound inequality. Remember, if it's an and, which means there's two circles and it's included in the middle, most of the time ands look like that. I write down that guy, a less than sign, 
an X, a less than sign, and that guy. So those two beginning and endings. Now the reason I didn't put an equal sign is because those are open circles. And so it's really that simple. But sometimes we forget the X and the less than, so we want to make sure it's exactly like that. You drop the numbers down, put the X in the middle with two less than signs. Okay, we're going to write this one. So here, it's an OR, so that means I need an OR. So first I'm going to just look at this one. It's going to be X. It's pointing to the left, so that's X is less than 5. Or X, and it's pointing to the right, so it's greater than 7. But it's also equal to 7, so I put the equal sign underneath it. All right, going back to learning target 7 for a minute. Actually, this is learning target 8. I wrote that wrong. 8. Okay, let's go. We're going to get rid of the parentheses in the middle. Now, when we have a compound inequality that is an and, that looks like this, it's not the word and, it's three parts, we have to remember to do the same thing to all three parts. That's the tricky part here. Our goal isn't to get x on the left or right. Our goal is to get x alone in the middle. So I always just work with this. So what is the negative 6 doing to the 2x? It's subtracting. I have to add. So I'm going to add 6 to, both, to all three parts. I get 22 is less than 2x, which is less than or equal to uh, 48. And then I ask myself, what's the 2 doing to the x? Because my goal is to get x alone in the middle. It's multiplying. So I divide. So I get 11 is less than x, which is, a less, which is less than uh, 24. And it didn't ask me to solve it. So that is my solution. I don't need the word and if it's written in three parts. If it was written separately in two inequalities, then I would need the word and. And last one. Okay, here we go. 4x minus 5 is greater than 11, or 6 minus x over 3 is greater than or equal to 8. So let's see. Um, I'm going to do this one first. Remember, you have to do them separately. You're not doing them all together. So we want to make sure that you remember that. So I added 5 to both sides. I'm going to divide by 4, and I get 4. x is greater than 4. Or, and then I'm going to do this, this one. 6 minus x over 3 is greater than or equal to 8. So I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. Sometimes I do that um, at, instead of getting rid of the fraction first, but it's definitely OK to get rid of the fraction first if you want to. And now I'm going to multiply both sides actually by negative 3 because I want to get rid of the negative and the 3 at the same time. You could do it separately if you wanted to, but keep in mind, I just multiplied by negative. So that means the negatives and the 3's cancel out, but I have to switch my inequality sign. So I get x is less than or equal to negative 6. So now I have to graph that. So 2, 4, 6, let's see. Um, 0, 2, 4, 6 negative 4, negative 8, so negative 6 is right here. It's a closed circle, and it says it's going to the left because it's less than. Over here, open circle on 4, and it says greater than, so I would do it like that. All right, that is the end of our beautiful review for our test. I hope you study hard and knock it out of the park tomorrow. Good luck. M squared, signing out.